Now I'd like to introduce uh, our keynote speakers for the day. Uh, Pam Yates and Paco Dionis are probably familiar to you. They've been uh, making films now for, I believe, more than 25 years. Uh, you uh, might have uh, seen or even taught uh, When the Mountains Tremble, one of uh, Pam Yates's early films. Um, and you might more recently have seen State of Fear or The Reckoning. Uh, and for many years, I have written about and admired these people's work and admired the integrity of their, um, their finished product and the way they re their relationships with their subjects. And as you can see, their, re their respectful relationship with their audience as well. What I've really been fascinated by in recent years is watching um, Pam and, and Paco develop, evolve, and grow with the emerging technologies and the possibilities, and consistently ask how those things can fulfill the same mandate that they have uh, had in the past for their films to make a difference in the world. And so I asked them to, to speak to us in, in a keynote that, for this session, for this conference, because I thought they were really excellent examples for us of people facing that challenge of using new technologies to accomplish a consistent uh, goal of making media that matters. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you to the Center for Social Media and American University. And it's such a pleasure to share the podium with George Stoney, who's been such an inspiration to us over the years. Thanks, George. Um, as Pat mentioned, Skylight Pictures. Um, I'm the co-founder with Peter Kanoy of Skylight Pictures. For 25 years plus, we have been creating media observing human rights, the quest for justice, and promoting positive social change. Our model is that we're a core group of three people, uh, Paco Deonis, the producer, Peter Kanoy, the editor, and I'm the director, plus an outreach team we call Skylight Social Media a kind of homage to the Center for Social Media. We bring three decades of experience to this process, and with each new film, we experiment and discover improved ways of maximizing the use, outreach, and impact of the work. We're also gonna tell you today in this presentation about ideas that failed, that didn't work well, and how we learned from them, what we learned from them, as well as all the foundations that we've been able to partner with um, in outreach now and in the past as a kind of practical information sharing with all of you who have shown great interest in this work. I'm gonna state one thing that's really obvious. It's so important if you're interested in doing outreach and audience engagement to find other people to work with in your core group. Um, I can't tell you how many filmmakers have come to me and said, I wanna do outreach, but I'm just one person, I'm just one filmmaker, I wanna make films, I don't know what to do, what can I do? And I always tell them, if you're going to really be successful at outreach, try to find other people to work with immediately, other filmmaking people that can help you create the materials that you'll need to do the outreach. We try to do everything ourselves in-house from conceiving of the films, to creating them, to editing them, to creating websites, to writing code, and building partnerships for outreach and education. And just so you get a sense of the kinds of films we make and their scope, I'd like to show you a trailer of our um, latest film, which is called The Reckoning, The Battle for the International Criminal Court. We first heard about the International Criminal Court when we were in a small town high in the Andes, talking to a Peruvian truth commissioner. And we asked him, what did you do before you were a truth commissioner? And he said, I worked for the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. And Paco asked, what's the International Criminal Court? This was in 2002, and the International Criminal Court was just coming into existence. So the truth commissioner told us about this incredible story about the creation of the International Criminal Court and how um, civil society organizations had come together from around the world to create it. It seemed like it was gonna be a new paradigm for social justice. So we thought, wouldn't it be incredible to um, follow the first six years of the International Criminal Court? Even though we've been making films for all these years, this was definitely the most complex film we ever made. Um, we filmed it across four continents and six languages, and really we began 
thinking about the film in 2002, and it had its premiere at Sundance in 2009. So I'm going to show you the clip. Thank you. Uh, before I get started talking about building relationships, um, I just want to say that Pat Ofter Heidi is not only a friend but a mentor for us as well because her philosophy of what public media is is something that we as filmmakers really share. And that is that the public media space is a space where citizens can get empowered, can be active citizens and you know, really active members of their society. And as filmmakers, we hope that we are bringing tools uh, to citizens in all different kinds of public media spaces, everything from community uh, groups to television broadcasts. And we'll be talking about that during the presentation. But um, one thing we learned with State of Fear quite clearly was the value of developing strong relationships with civil society groups or NGOs that are stakeholders around the same issue that, that you have in your film. And so, State of Fear uh, was about truth commissions in Peru, and we developed relationships with a whole range of uh, NGO partners there. When we started to think about the uh, reckoning, we realized we should start even earlier, because with Peru, it started sort of halfway through the making of the film. With the reckoning, we started even before we wrote the proposal and identified who are the groups out there, the nonprofits, the NGOs, that care about this issue of international justice and are working towards that. And this, the groups you see up here on the screen, all of them, uh, and, and to different degrees and in different areas, have networks of their own through their membership, uh, through, um, <clears throat> through uh, offices around the world, uh, some of them are, are global NGOs. And uh, we invited them to be our, our outreach partners as we were starting to think about the film. And we chose key people from each one of these organizations uh, to be on our advisory board. So this group, which we met with frequently, we had sort of outreach summits as the process of the film went along. It usually takes us about three or four years to make a film. So during that whole process, uh, we would have ma meetings maybe twice a year, uh, show them some footage, get their opinion. They have no editorial control, and they know that from the start. But their opinions are really valuable. They've been thinking about the subject for many years. They know all of the key players in, in that field. And they give you introductions to people on the ground in places like where we filmed The Reckoning in Africa, in Latin America, in The Hague, and in, in New York. And so it's an extremely valuable element in the process of making a film. And it shouldn't be treated as something that you do after you finish the film. Because they become really invested in the film. They, they, they want to see the film succeed. And by the time you get to the making of the film, uh, I mean to the releasing of the film, they're totally on board and they all have big networks of their own. Uh, so it becomes this really huge social network that you are working with and they sort of expand your impact in a really big way. So. And stepping back for a minute, I'd just like to talk about our previous film, State of Fear which Paco and I used to sort of illustrate how we ramped up to the present and our ideas about um, working with outreach partners. Um, because this is when we began exploring some of the techniques we now use for outreach and distribution in The Reckoning and we're envisioning using into the future. We found that when we make our films about one specific story and make the films as true as we can to the spirit of that story. But keep in mind the underlying universal themes. The films can have great impact in other places. We're always looking for ways to reach um, underserved audiences and to find new audiences. State of Fear was made in 2005, which was in the midst of the US so-called war on terror. And we felt that the Peruvian experience State of Fear is based on the findings of the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their 20-year, what they call, War on Terror, had a lot of lessons to teach to American audiences. But we were actually very surprised with how it resonated around the world beyond um, the United States and the West. And now I'm going to show you a, a short clip from State of Fear. 
Because of the kind, thanks. Thank you. Because of the kind of resonance that state of fear had, not only in the United States, but in countries caught in a cycle of conflict around the world, we discovered that multiple language versions of the film are a great tool for human rights. And we try to make sure with our films that no access is ever denied. If people don't have money, or if they have a little bit of money, or if they can trade um, uh, an, um, a mailing list, or if there's some kind of quid pro quo that we can barter, uh, we're always willing to offer the film, um, sometimes even for free. Because really, the, the reason that we make these films is to get them out there. Um, the universality of the theme of the erosion of democracy in the face of terrorism and this need for security while maintaining civil liberties made State of Fear travel around the world. It was broadcast in 146 countries and translated into 44 languages. And uh, an example of when Pam says uh, about not denying access to, um, to anybody for the film. And by the way, uh, we basically stopped doing distribution deals uh, with State of Fear because uh, they were too limiting. Uh, you give up too much to the distributor, and if you're an activist filmmaker and you want to decide how your film will be used uh, and what terms you want to give, uh, you know you just can't have somebody with a distribution deal hanging over your head. So, uh, so we really started getting into uh, seriously into self-distribution, and. Um, after the film had its world premiere at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival in New York in 2005, uh, we got an email from this gentleman who's sitting there in the center of, uh, this, uh, of the police there. His name is Kanak Dixit, and uh, he is a pro-democracy activist in Nepal who had gone to the website of Human Rights Watch and uh, read the description of our film and asked to see it, if we could just send him a copy. And they couldn't even afford a FedEx, so we had to wait for a friend of theirs to fly to Nepal and take the film. But when they saw it, they said, wow, this film really has incredible parallels to Nepal. Uh, you know, King Gyanendra, the, the king there, was like Fujimori in their eyes. And the Maoists of Nepal were like Shining Path in Peru. And the uh, pro-democracy activists in Nepal, they saw like the human rights movement in Peru. So they asked if they could make a Nepali version, which uh, we said, yes, of course. And we sent them the elements and then they did a dubbed Nepali version of State of Fear, which they used in their work uh, uh, during the pro-democracy movement, especially in the last year before the king finally uh, was uh, thrown out of power. And uh, they, they made 200 DVDs, which they used in workshops and screen. They screened it for the 6,000 members of the Nepali Bar Association, which they say was a very influential screening. And uh, everybody in Nepal, they said, was looking at the ex Peruvian experience as a mirror of theirs. Uh, so. Th those kind of things, when they happen with your film, are very gratifying, and they're unexpected. You know that your film goes out and takes on a life of its own, often that you know things you could never imagine. And uh, it, fun it was funny because Kanak eventually came to New York uh, to visit his daughter, who was studying there, and uh, we had lunch with him. And he said, "You know, I'm really glad that you let us make uh, the Nepali version of the film uh, without charging us anything." And we said, "Well, of course." And he said, "Yeah, because if you hadn't, we would have done it anyway." So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that so give in to it. Yeah, I think so. So then, um, so, but one of the language versions that we hadn't made yet, and this was uh, in 2008, the beginning of 2008, um, was a Quechua version. Seventy percent of the victims of the Peruvian conflict were Quechua speakers, and many of them are illiterate uh, and don't really speak Spanish. It's, it's, it's really a second language for them, if at all. And uh, so we, we went to the Ford Foundation that had given us the majority of the funding for, um, for State of Fear and uh, said, you know, we really should make a language version, a Quechua language version of the film uh, to put out there in the region of Ayacucho in the high Andes uh, where most of the violence occurred. And they, they said yes, they supported it. And then we started the process and we uh, put together a Quechua translation team uh, and went down to Lima and brought them to Lima because they're from the mountains, from Ayacucho. And uh, they all work in radio there. So they had experience as uh, local broadcasters, a local community radio station where they worked. 
And we sat around a conference table for 10 days, hashing out, you know, line by line, the entire script. Uh, and it was really a fascinating process because the Quechua cosmology, their vision of the world is in, in, very, in very fundamental ways very different from ours. Uh, their, their sense of time is that the past is in front of you and the future is behind you. Kind of like riding a train uh, facing backwards. Uh, because they say the past already happened, so you see it, so it's in front of you, and the future hasn't happened, so how could you know what it is, so it's behind you. Uh, so, so we had to wrap our minds around these kind of concepts when we were dealing with uh, moments in the film which go back and forth in time. And uh, also their concept of reconciliation is to bury it. You know, whatever the problem was, just bur and it literally means in Quechua, bury it. And um, for us uh, in the West and the Truth Commissions, reconciliation is more about looking at the past, examining it, and, and you know, reconciling with it. So, uh, and since these were fundamental concepts in the film, it was a really fascinating thing to, um, to be part of that translation. And then uh, Pam directed them in the studio there in Lima uh, to do the voices, and so we have a completely voiced over version of, uh, of State of Fear in Quechua. And um, it was the first documentary ever dubbed into Quechua, by the way. And so for, for the Quechua people, it was really an event. And we then decided to launch the film uh, in the Ayacucho region. And the Sundance documentary program had just started an outreach uh, grant program. And so we were one of the first recipients of one of their outreach grants, which allowed us to go out there and show the film. And here's a little clip of uh, one of the showings that we did in a public plaza in the Ayacucho region. So, um, this was in the summer of 2008, and uh, it, it, you know, one of our one of our goals is always to reach underserved audiences, and what I would call also kind of the most obvious audience in a way. And you know, this we consider this to be the most important version of State of Fear, because it, the the demand for it as citizens. And speaking of public media, I mean, I, I, we really think this is a perfect example. Uh, at these screenings with our local NGO partner in Peru, uh, who have an office in the regional capital of Ayacucho, they told people, because everybody wanted a copy, and so we said, well, if you bring a blank DVD to the office of the NGO, you, they'll burn your copy for free. And we told them, you know, this is your film, there's no copyright issue, you know, it's copy left, actually. And, um, so. Over the ensuing um, three, four months, over 600 people showed up to have a copy made. And what that means in that region is that each one of those persons is representing a community because they're coming from far-flung villages that sometimes could take six, seven hours on a bus to get to Ayacucho uh, to make their copy and then take it back to their community. So that's an example of very grassroots and low-tech outreach uh, that I think is incredibly important. And the NGO also used the film in a tour. They, they were going around the whole region to gather uh, names of, an, to make an official list of victims of the violence. Uh, and, and that was based on these victims telling their stories and what happened to them and giving testimony. And that list was really important because the people who, who made it onto that list were eligible for reparations from the government as part of the reparations plan. So the, the film was used as a trigger to get them to think about their past. And I think as you saw in some of the faces in that clip, I mean, people were really moved by this. Uh, some of the older ones had lived it. Some of the younger ones had only heard about it from their parents. But it's a really good example of uh, historical memory being brought out, and, and the film is a tool for that. And it was so that Peruvian society could witness the close collaboration of victims and human rights organizations that brought him to justice. Alberto Fujimori was convicted. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. He appealed the conviction and he lost the appeal. So, you know, the, the victories in the field of human rights and, and using media and making your media matter are few and far between. 
And so when they happen, you have to mark them, you have to celebrate them, and you have to use them to recharge your batteries. Um, another thing that we discovered while we were making State of Fear and then really parlayed and developed more deeply in The Reckoning was develop, re developing relationships while we're working in the field. Um, we develop local partners um, to, to be able to do that. What a lot of people call fixers, I find that really a derogatory word. Um, I call line producers because really they're people that help you produce the film that you're making. And they um, help you put things in front of the camera. They give you the cultural context. They make you sensitive to what's going on. They tell you history. Uh, they're often your translators, too. So we developed a series of partners. Uh, we learn from our local producers. They impart a huge amount of information and knowledge. And then when the film is finished, they work with us in outreach. They already have a stake in the film because they were there while we were making the film. And um, we raise outreach funds so that we can keep them on and keep them working with us locally. These are some of the outreach partners that we worked with on The Reckoning throughout um, Africa and Colombia. So um, then while we were making, while we were making The Reckoning, uh, we heard about the Bayback Producers Institute. And it sounded like a perfect, um, Thing for us to apply to. So, uh, so we applied because you know, the whole idea, as most of you probably know, is that you know, to incorporate new media technologies into expanding the impact of, of a documentary film. So we were lucky and we got in and when we were there we created this site called IJ Central, International Justice Central, which um, is uh, still up and running. Uh, we learned uh, from the first experiment in Peru and uh, while we were there at Bayback, this was 2008 again, um, we, you know, Twitter was just coming on the scene uh, and it was free, so with our developer, we wrote some code to basically pick up, and, and we, we laid this on top of Google Maps, and we were really lucky because Google, about two weeks before that Bayback, uh, released its API so that w we could play around with their maps. And, so we built a, a map based on Google, uh, sort of behind, it's, it's a Google map structure, but with our own design. And <clears throat> we created a filter that would pick up any tweet in the world uh, that was talking about the International Criminal Court or international justice. And, and we thought, well, let's see what happens. And so they started to appear. And, and in, the, in, in the months as they went by, also smartphones started to be used more. And then suddenly there were Twitter applications for iPhone and for other phones, and um, Twitter started to be used a lot more, and then suddenly it exploded, as you all know. And, and then we originally had thought, well, we're, well, we'll use Twitter at the beginning, but then we'll have to build our own system with uh, text messaging. But uh, Twitter became so big that and now it's become this ongoing, uh, basically, conversation, information sharing of people all over the world that are concerned about international justice. We, we've, we're finding a way to bind together a constituency and, and have this conversation. And, and what we do is when people appear on the map, we, we reply to them and let them know that, you know what, there's a site called IJ Central that you just appeared on because you talked about the International Criminal Court. And um, so then they, re they go there, they realize, and then they become regulars, a lot of them. So we have a whole bunch of um, regulars, if you will, on this, uh, on this Twitter global conversation. And other things that we do at IJ Central, uh, we, we aggregate blogs. Um, these are all blogs that you see here. Uh, it, this changes on a daily basis uh, because we have somebody who's doing that, who you know, oversees the site and, and curates it and does the aggregation. And uh, we have a huge video gallery which we've developed uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, there are many, many, many pages of videos that are either taken from, so there are a lot of the ICC cases are in Africa, so we get videos from local news stations in Africa. Uh, we have, there's a weekly video uh, summary, 10 minutes long, that is issued by the court itself. Uh, and there are many, we have made over a dozen short films related to the ICC uh, for educational and advocacy purposes, uh, which are also there. So it's, 
It's become a big um, resource for international justice for people that are interested in it. And then we built a, a site called IJ Central Action Community. We took a Ning, we, we basically took a Ning site, we made it look like IJ Central. And uh, people join there. We uh, have a version of the film which we stream for free there. Uh, it's the one hour version. So that's up there streaming. And um, it's proved to be a really great, uh, you know, we, we have hundreds of uh, members and, and we're, we have projects in the works, like we're gonna have direct Q and A's with the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court uh, and other sort of engagement uh, ideas that we're working on and also, we're also listening to our members and what, what their ideas are. But uh, the, the, the fundamental idea is to build an active constituency around the idea that international justice is something that should be supported and you know, it, where it needs to be fixed, it needs to be fixed, but just that people are involved. Uh, that's part of one of the goals of us uh, as filmmakers is to, to, to get that kind of involvement. And so it's, um, it's an ongoing process, it's a you know, work in progress, and um, Anybody who wants to go visit IJ Central or watch our film there, um, you're more than welcome, of course. And so other things that are aggregated here are just news feeds from all over the world about international justice. So, so this is an example of a site that we created that's not about the film, but it's about the issue in the film. And you'll see the reckoning mentioned here and there in the site, but it's on our Skylight Pictures website that it's really page about the film and it's, it's, it's about filmmaking and so it's, it's a different focus and um, let me go back to the keynote here and then we it's uh, one of the things that also we're developing for IJ Central you see here Dennis Lemoy who is the camp leader of an in internally displaced persons camp in northern Uganda he's in our film uh, we developed a strong relationship with him uh, he's always texting, so he's, you know, totally on with text. And um, we, we're going to use a, a software called Frontline SMS, which uh, was developed for humanitarian work. And it's, it's really a clever software. If you get a local partner, like say, you know, we have an NGO partner in Uganda that would put it on their computer, and it's free. And you, so there will, you, you buy a, a local cell phone with a local number, and you can communicate with, for example, Dennis Lemoy uh, could have a screening of the reckoning in his camp. And then through Frontline SMS, we could have a Q&A between a high school class or law school class in, here in the US and the people in the camp, uh, sending questions by text messaging and, and, and sending them back. So the, like with Frontline SMS, you can broadcast text messages. So you can send one text message to 20 people at once or 30 people at once. And uh, it's, it's a really great software that I would encourage you to look into. It's just Frontline SMS, Google it, you'll find it. And um, so th that's another one of the projects that we have looking ahead for IJ Central. And um, here I go back to the NGO partners because this is the stage when you release the film where they were amazing. Uh, uh, they all put it on their front pages of their websites, they really pushed it, even though we were giving the film away for free, and uh, we, we broadcast it on POV, uh, still law schools all over the world were buying the film. Uh, we, we actually sold more DVDs giving the film away than any other film, so it's, it's counterintuitive, but, but we feel that uh, having the film available for free is kind of like an advertisement. Uh, so. It worked, and um, as you can see, New Day Films has been added there. We are members of New Day Films, and we, uh, we distribute to the educational market through New Day Films. Um, we don't go for the standard theatrical release of our feature-length documentaries, not because we wouldn't want it, but really because it means giving up rights to a distributor who usually wants all rights to the film, and, encumbers, and, and that would encumber our outreach efforts. Um, that means, of course, we can't qualify for Oscar consideration. But I, I just recently read this interesting statistic that of the 89 feature-length documentary films that qualified for Oscar consideration last year, 72 paid to qualify 
In other words, they spent minimum $50,000 to make the prints to be able to project in theaters um, seven days consecutively in New York and Los Angeles with paid advertising. So we were thinking, you know, we'd really rather put that money into some kind of outreach plan for the reckoning and, and not do that. Um, but we were very fortunate that the reckoning was selected by POV to be broadcast there last summer. And our, our relationship with POV, um, we really make, the reckoning is really the flagship for many other things that we want to do for the film. It's really just the beginning. And working with POV was a perfect storm because it was, uh, they felt the exact same way about how to get the film out there, that the broadcast was just the opening salvo. Um, and so working with them was really creating something that was bigger than the sum of our individual parts. Um, they helped us raise money, not only for the broadcast, but together we, ra we fundraised and were able to get funds from the fledgling fund to make three short 10 to 15 minute educational videos. Those are not excerpts from the film. Those are, um, one was like the, the history of the International Criminal Court. So we used a lot of new material that we had gathered for the film, but that actually hadn't made it into the reckoning. And as we began to edit these films, we began to develop this whole other art of the educational module. Um, together with POV, uh, we created supplemental print and online educational materials. Um, and, they, and POV was able to build on IJ Central and the many outreach partners that we had traveled the journey of making the reckoning with to the table. Um, we streamed our film for, f contractually we were obliged to stream our film for free for 30 days on the PBS website. And we loved that so much that um, we decided to continue to stream it after the 30 days to take the geo block off so you could see it for anywhere in the world. And we ended up um, leaving the film on there for six months. The only reason we took it down and put it on, on Vimeo was because PBS doesn't allow anyone to opt into a social network. So although 50,000 people streamed the film for free online, we have no idea who they are. They, have, they don't really have a way to get in touch with us. And we really felt that that was a missed opportunity in this day and age. Hopefully that'll change, but I think it'll change if all of us together pressure PBS to um, open up and make that happen. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to add, regarding moving it over to Vimeo, which is where it's hosted, but you get to it through our site. Uh, the information you get from being on Vimeo is fantastic because if somebody takes your film and embeds it in their own blog, uh, you, yeah. you see where it is. You can you know, have the email of that person, you can be in touch with them. Everybody who watches the film, you have their email because we, that's all we require is that if you want to watch a film for free, just you know, join and, and give us your email because we'd like to be in touch. And with um, PBS, 50,000 people are just unknown to us and they all watch the film. So uh, that's tragic. <laughs> Along with the, um, all of the supplemental materials, POV launched an incredible national public awareness campaign. And I, I have to have a shout out here to Eliza Licht, who's the outreach coordinator from POV. She's here, um, reaching over 30 million people through this public awareness campaign. And we have a handout outside that sort of details how, how we did that, so you can see the rationale behind the statistics. Because it was really through a variety of high-tech and low-tech strategies ranging from a satellite media tour where we went into a studio in New York and people were able, um, uh, radio and television broadcasters from around the country were able to call in um, to do interviews with us and get the video and get the audio. Um, that was with funding from the Righteous Persons Foundation. Um, and then we also did community screenings um, with POV. POV provided screening kits for uh, audiences up to about 100 people, and one of the filmmakers did a Skype Q&A from our computers. Yeah. Okay, and here, here one, and, and, and an experience that is new for us with, um, with The Reckoning was uh, working very closely with some of our partners, like Facing History and Ourselves, that developed curricula about human rights for high school, so they have a network of 25,000 high school teachers. Anyway, we spent uh, last summer uh, having several meetings with them uh, 
developing three short films that would be part of a course that they were designing around the reckoning and a course about international justice. And uh, so making a film with them was very different from you know, the flagship film that we make, which is designed to engage audiences emotionally and uh, cinematically as well as uh, on the issue. But these are more focused uh, for use by a high school teacher. Uh, and that was um, really a, a gratifying experience. Uh, and the, you know, now they're being used in, in high schools. Uh, it's going to be year after year after year. So it really extends the impact of the film. And um, another example that's happening right now, what you see here is the draft of the cover for uh, screening kits that we're making right now as we speak. There's a thousand screening kits which are going to go to Africa to, um, what ha just to give you some background, when the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for President al-Bashir of Sudan over the Darfur uh, crisis, the yes, al-Bashir reacted quite strongly and rallied with African leaders uh, to denounce the ICC and say they weren't going to cooperate with the ICC. But then African civil society groups got together and said, no, that's no good. The victims are African. Uh, you have to have some solution for the victims here. Or you can't just say uh, no to the ICC and not give us an alternative. And so and if you don't give us an alternative, we're supporting the ICC. And we got in touch with them, and there are hundreds of these uh, civil society groups. They all wanted to use the film. Uh, and sh they wanted to use the shorter one-hour version. And also, we made, in consultation with them, we made two short films, uh, one about the history of the ICC in Africa and another one about this peace and justice issue uh, when an ongoing conflict is happening. And so these screening kits uh, are in French and in English, and they're, they're going to be distributed next month to hundreds of African civil society groups. They're going to use them to educate people locally about the ICC, because the ICC actually uh, is a big subject of debate in, in, in all over Africa, and especially in the countries where there are ICC cases. So um, this, is, this is another example of low-tech uh, outreach, but uh, I think very effective. Um, also, this outreach is being funded by Humanity United and the MacArthur Foundation, this yeah. outreach effort. Yes. And, um, State of Fear and the Reckoning are two films in a quartet of films that we're making about international justice. State of Fear, about truth. The Reckoning, about justice. The next film is, is, is called Granito. It's about legacy. And the final film will be about memory, called The Future of Memory. So I'd like to show you a 10-minute sample from Granito which means tiny grain of sand, the film we're working on right now. Because I think it's a good example of um, trying to make your media matter, but making your media matter in ways that you can't always foresee. Twenty-five years ago, when I was filming the war in Guatemala. Yeah. Start again. Okay. We have sound. Thank you. Brave woman. So I hope at the end of this conference we can all think about how we're going to add our granito de arena. I'd be happy to, we'd be happy to answer questions and hear any comments you have. There are microphones in the audience, so please step up to the microphone. Can, can you lower the lights a little bit on the stage so we can see the audience better? Go, okay. 
Good morning, my name is Wendy Thompson Marquez. I'm currently working on a documentary on immigration. It's based on a book written by Juan Gonzalez, Harvest of Empire, and how this country has influenced the major wave of immigration coming from Central America to this country. And uh, I'm, we're getting ready to launch a social media campaign. And I would like to know uh, the number of your social media team and if your bloggers were journalists. The team is basically three people, but only one full time. But okay. then we have a, we have what I would call the social media producer or director, uh, uh, and that's the full time. And the others are when we need them, which are the code writer and uh, a designer. Yeah. And in terms of budget, how much money did you allocate for that component? Uh, all together with the building of it and all about $200,000. So, okay. And it's a three-year plan. Okay. You also talked about the fact that you were most successful in, this, in providing the film for free that you were able, uh, later were able to sell. Uh, may I ask you, I don't know if this is a no-no question, how much money were, in terms of your return on investment, uh, were, how successful were you in selling the film later on, if you were able to recoup your costs? Well, that's, um, our business model, you should know, it's not based on recouping the costs uh, in, in order to make another film, because we never, we could never sell that many DVDs. Uh, we, we try to get the film financed as much as possible, 100% if possible, uh, with foundation grants, mm -hmm. uh, or in some cases, like Granito that you just saw, it's a combination of uh, Latino public broadcasting, ITVS, and foundations, and kind of cobbled together over the last five years. Mm -hmm. And um, so th what the DVD sales do for us is keep our doors open uh, while we're developing other films and raising the money for other films. So it's, it's just really meant to, it, it's been a huge help, and I have to say, that joining New Day Films a few years ago was also a really good economic decision as well as a great experience to join this community of filmmakers that, you know, New Day Films has been now in, in operating for 40 years. Uh, the 40th anniversary is coming right up. And uh, it, it functions and uh, it's, uh, it, it works on every level. It's an amazing organization. So anyway, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but we, uh, we get a lot of our income that keeps the doors open, uh, particularly through the educational sales. And Great. we actually sold the DVD right away. I mean, I think we finished the film two days before we went to Sundance, and at our first screening at Sundance, we sold DVDs. Just like, you know, you go to hear um, a great concert, and you go out and you buy the you buy the music or you buy the t-shirt. And uh, it was really funny because when we sold it at Sundance, we sold them for 20 bucks because, you know, everybody's got 20 bucks from their, their ATM machine. And they, everyone freaked out there because, you know, Sundance is the place where you're supposed to get the big distribution deal. The and organizers The organizers, I mean, the organizers freaked out and they actually prohibited us from selling it. So we had, but we had our whole team there. So we just went, you know, outside across the street and, and people still bought it, and we were actually able, we were, we were actually able to um, help pay for all of our crew coming in the house for the Sundance Festival yeah. through all those sales. So really, being able to sell it right away, um, without any distribution encumbrance, was important for us. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I just take one moment to invite everyone who's standing to to sit down if you'd like? and maybe squeeze in a little bit if we need to make room. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to say I'm just uh, blown away by the importance and uh, just uh, crucial impact your films have had and the incredible work you're doing in the social networking to get it out. It's just an incredible, both incredible model and just a major contribution to the planet and to the, the crucial case of so much repression that's been going on. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, as you look at the International Criminal Court and that kind of evolving kernel of, of our coming together as a world, uh, what do you see as kind of the future? I mean, what would, you, what, would you, what would you like to see in terms of how we could evolve a world where we didn't have to prosecute genocide after it happened, but could create a world where it's not happening in the first place? How, how do you, 
what's your kind of vision for the planet? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> That's well, all. Well, I'll, I'll just, I think I might narrow it to the International Criminal Court. I'd like to see universal ratification of the Rome Statute, the treaty on which the court is based. Uh -huh. And I think in terms of, you know, the United States is not a member of the International Criminal Court. And so it's really up to us citizens to push from the grassroots up to um, make sure that we approach becoming members of the International Criminal Court. The Obama administration, there is a rapprochement now and um, at the review conference of the ICC in Kampala in June, where Paco is going to take a thousand of these French and English screening kids, they're sending um, a big delegation of Americans. Harold Coe, the legal advisor to the State Department, is going, and the ambassador for war crimes issues, Stephen Rapp, is going. So um, that's uh, universal ratification of the International Criminal Court, I, I, I can see as um, a goal in our lifetime. Yeah, just for that to happen. A constituency has to be built here in the U.S. that actually understands what the court is. So that's one of the really uh, fundamental reasons that we made the film. And um, our outreach plan here is ongoing. I mentioned facing history in ourselves, but we also have the American Society of International Law, which has chapters in every law school in the country, uh, a plan over the next two years of introducing the film, uh, taking it there, having screenings, and then having the film be used year after year, semester after semester, and, and hopefully some law students will decide to go into that field. But uh, until the general public really understands what the court is and that it's not a threat, as, as I believe, uh, you know, the, the right wing you know, anti-court people, you know, they, they could just start demonizing it, as has happened a couple of times already. And uh, if people don't know about it, they get scared. They think, oh, the court's going to take our boys away, this kind of thing. So, the, the educational part is fundamental, and it's long-term. It's, it's a long-term thing, it, it, you know, but if you get it into schools where it gets taught every semester, you basically have to kick it off, and then hopefully the teachers uh, will keep using it. Thank you. I have a, a question. Um, I understand that, at least in the past, certain indigenous peoples like the Quechuans have... Uh, that don't really like having their pictures taken because the belief was that it stole their souls. Now, I under <laughs> you've got great footage, and I'm wondering if that was an issue for you, and if so, how did you overcome that kind of, that belief? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we never go into places without going, without, you know, building a relationship first, going there without the camera, and having people, uh, when we actually come back with the crew, welcome us. So, uh, you know, I will, first of all, I would never take a picture of someone without asking them. And, but in terms of filming, you know, which requires this huge coordination and crew, and I always say, when you're in production, even if you have a modest crew, you're really hemorrhaging money. So how, how, how are you going to build those relationships? Who can help you? Who can um, believe in your project, as you describe it to them, that will uh, give you some of those inroads? But I think time is really key here, and that's why it takes us so long to make films, because it's really critical to, to build those relationships, and then also to respect people who say no. I've Thanks. become more and more conservative about that, the, the, so, o, o, the more experience I have. So when you were filming the audience that was looking, you know, viewing your film, did those people were pretty accepting of that. I mean, I don't, did you ask their permission in advance or just globally ask? We, yeah, we told them yeah. that we would be okay. filming it. They didn't have any problem with it. Actually, in our time in, in the Andes, we didn't run into anybody, this idea of the soul being stolen. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, some people, like anywhere, aren't interested in being on camera. But others are really interested in being on camera. <laughs> okay. Maybe too much sometimes. <laughs> so you said that you have to find a... People who, are, and also we're looking for people who represent an essential part of the bigger picture of what happened in Peru, so that it's an emblematic story and not necessarily just that one person's story. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, we have some films we would like to develop for an educational market or re repurpose, and I wondered if you can offer, suggest some resources or um, sites that can help us develop the relationships or uh, mm -hmm. figure out how to, how to best use our films in an educational context? Well, uh, first of all, there are, there are a lot of foundations that 
won't fund a film being made, but they are interested after it's made if it fits with their mission. Mm -hmm. So we actually got a lot of outreach funding from foundations that would not have given us money to make the film. But once the film is made, that risk is over, and they also know what the film is. They can see it. And so if they're comfortable with that, um, they could be. So what, I'm not sure what the issues in your film are, but the first thing I would do is look for uh, organizations, foundations that are grant-making foundations and who would uh, share the same mission mm -hmm. and propose to them that you, you, know, you could repurpose it for educational use, but also uh, figure out where educationally, is it universities, is it high schools, is it both? Right. Uh, so, you know, I think of a little research, depending on the issue in your film. I think one thing that helped us, too, is that we partnered very early on with Facing History and Ourselves, which is a very respected educational uh, network. I know it, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. so then when we went to foundations to raise money for the outreach, that gave us the bona fides, because they knew then that Facing History, would work, we were going to be working hand in hand. Mm -hmm. so, so even though we really had no experience creating educational modules for high school curriculum, um, the foundations knew that working with Facing History would be a good combo. So I guess my issue is more the connection with the educational market itself. Oh, okay, like dis yeah. how to distribute to the educational right. market. Yeah. Well, and, the first and, thing I would try is to send your, apply to New Day Films. Okay. And if you get mm -hmm. in, you become a, a member of the co-op and all the information, the lists, uh, the whole structure it's completely transparent once you're a member. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Roy Kahn. <clears throat> I want to just thank you for your great work. Um, and I just wonder if you would talk a little bit more um, about nurturing relationships with nonprofit and NGO partners, what it is that you actually offer them. Um, I know that you talked about sort of getting them involved and deeply invested in your projects. But I wonder if you could sort of give a bit more, a few more de details about sort of how sure. that works and how those relationships work. Well, you know, um, our yeah. NGO partners, many of our NGO partners, when we were making the reckoning, knew a lot more about international justice and the ICC than we did when we started making it. And so, and, and a lot of them, for a lot of them, their mission is to uh, spread the word and to um, do outreach themselves. So they saw us as being able to help them do that outreach. And they saw us as, um, as, as um, giving advice, giving information, giving insight, talking about history that, that we didn't have. For example, one of the first people we went to talk to, Richard Dicker at Human Rights Watch, he said that the most amazing moment of his whole 40 years work in human rights was the day at the Rome Conference when the Rome Statute was passed. And I always remember that because he's had so many varied experiences. So in the film, you know, we really tried to build that up as this climactic moment. One of those moments I was talking about where there's a human rights victory that are so few and far between. Um, don't ever ask NGOs for money. They're always looking for money themselves. <laughs> um, and, 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 and really talk about your film as, as um, a way for them to strengthen their mission. Because what they can do speaking before a crowd of 100 or 200, if your film is broadcast, it can do for 5 million or 10 million. And um, uh, there's varying levels of sophistication with using audiovisual materials, but some are very, very forward. Yeah. And ju just as a note to that, too, in, in the process, when we were really in the final months of editing and the film was shaping, shaping to its final form, they, they weren't all happy with every editorial decision we made, but they had to live with it. But sometimes they made suggestions that were sort of, oh yeah, that's, you know, wow, I hadn't thought about that. So it, it's, uh, and, and in the end, uh, even if they had a couple of reservations about one scene or another in the film, they still embraced the film and they've been using it. Uh, all of these partner organizations have really been using the film a lot. And uh, so for them, it's also, without that, it costing them anything, you know, they have this great tool to advance their mission. Hi, I wonder if you might um, talk a little bit about your roles um, in the filmmaking process, like you spend 30% of your time raising funds, 10% making films, 
and so on. Could you just go through that in a typical project or year? Well, we, um, yeah, uh, the three of us, Peter, Paco, and I, really um, were involved in every aspect of the filmmaking. In other words, we conceive of the ideas, we do the research together. Paco and I go on the shoots, Peter doesn't, but we're also present in the editing room, and yet we have each a division of labor. So Paco is always r raising the money, and now he's actually raising the money for the next film while we're making and finishing the film before. And Peter and I are in the editing room finishing the film. Um, while we're on production, Peter's actually making the modules for the screening kits that are going to Africa for our last film. So it's really, it's sort of hearkening back to what I said in the beginning about finding a group to work with, because I know so many great filmmakers have such a struggle because it's a solitary existence. So um, in terms of, gee, we, we kind of all do everything, but we have each a responsibility um, that we have to take primary leadership in. And, and that's really kind yeah. of how we conceive our model. In, in terms of titles, uh, I'm the producer, Pam's the director, and Peter's editor. But then we always credit our films as a film by the three of us as well, so, because it really is. I think also, you probably spend about 80% of your time raising money or building relationships on the road to raising money. And that takes a and huge amount of, well. and, and outreach, and that takes a huge amount of time. And, and outreach too, because it's not just you make a good film and they're gonna take it out. You really have to work with your outreach partners consistently to make sure that they're really understanding the potential of what you're giving them and how they, how they can use it. Not just the film, you know, but all the other materials and the modules. And but, but there are some great organizations which were credited at the beginning here, like Working Films and Active Voice, that if you, know, if you don't have someone like me inside, doing that, they, they do you know, great work. Uh, with films and outreach around films. So I don't know if you've ever been in touch with them, but they're both uh, really, really good. I think Active Voice is in the house, right? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.